Stay tuned for the latest message excerpt from josephprince.com. I started by saying, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you, child of God, you are complete in Christ. First he says, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then God says, but you know something? You are complete in Christ. God has put you in Christ and you are complete. Amen. The amazing thing, church, is this. God says you are righteous, but there are preaching going on in churches today that says, you know, if you are holy enough, one day you'll be righteous. No, 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 my friend. You are now holy, righteous, and blameless. Your actions might not correspond yet. My son does not walk like an adult because he's still a baby. But one day, trust me, he'll walk like an adult. And he won't want me to baby him anymore. So keep on feeding the people. Amen? Pastors and leaders, keep on feeding the people. Don't beat the people. Feed. And they'll come to a place where their actions will correspond. But meanwhile, the truth is that whether you're a rich or poor Christian, whether you are young or old believer, you are complete in Christ. You are not less complete than one who is 10 years Christian. You are complete in Christ. And in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So what we have done is that we take the starting post, you are complete in Christ, and we have, we have made it the finishing post. That's the problem. We tell people, one day, the finishing post. We think in the natural. We think like a human. Instead of Reasoning from God downwards, we are reasoning from man upwards. God's reasoning, God's, God's reality is that you are complete in Christ. Even though you're safe this morning, you're complete in Christ. Now walk out that completeness. And if you fall and appear incomplete, you're still complete. Your fall does not incomplete you. Because your action in the first place did not complete you. It was Christ. So, that's the finishing, that's the starting post. The starting post is you're complete. Don't make the starting post the finishing post. One day you'll be complete. I'm going to show you right now how many Christians think. And that's the reason they don't see the deliverance. Because there's something, you know, very profound. If you come to God, if you're a child of God and you come to God like a sinner, God doesn't respond to you. Because he's no more God to you, he's Father. Even when you fail, you come to God as a sinner, and you say, God, I, I have sinned, God. Uh, I'm a sinner, Lord. I, I'm a sinner saved by grace, God. God, have mercy on me. Be merciful to me, the sinner. And you think you're copying the guy that Jesus talked about who wasn't even saved. Now you're confusing the issue. Are you a child addressing the Father, or are you a sinner addressing God? Once upon a time, we were all sinners, and we addressed God. As, as, as a sinner, we address God. We can say things that be merciful to me, the, a sinner, and that's right. But God is no more just God to us, His Father. And we are no more sinners to Him. We are His children. And our cry is, Abba. When we teach things like this, the, the thing is that miracles happen. Something about the truth that the Holy Spirit bears witness with truth. You know, when I preach on rest in Jesus' faith for miracles, I have a title called Rest in, in 2008, I think I preached it. Well, I don't know when I preached it, but anyway. Rest in, Je rest in Jesus' faith, Jesus' faith for miracles. I talk about when you know you're complete in Christ, what do you do? <sighs> you rest. There is no rest when you're trying to get something, striving to get something, striving for victory, praying for victory. But there's such a rest when you're praying from victory. You still pray, but you pray. That's why when you pray, you must come to God. Before you come to God, don't, don't, just, don't just come and throw your request so fast. Just come and know that He loves you. You're coming to a Father. Don't talk about the God of the universe. He is the God of the universe. But you must not allow how people see Him to be how you see Him. You have a different relationship. He's your Father, a Father that loves to hear your voice. In the Song of Songs, it says this, Let me hear your voice. But before he says, let me hear your voice, he says, let me see your face. Let me see your, thy countenance. And then let me hear your voice. Notice the order. It is your presence that he wants, not just your voice. 
It's one thing for Jessica to talk to me on the staircase or in the living room, and I'm in the room. Uh, Daddy, yes, you know, but I would love for her to come in my presence. I don't want to talk. I can hear her voice. So the Bible says, God wants to see your face and then hear your voice. So when you come to God, you have a prayer request. You know, just, and just know that He loves you when you come to His presence. Stop there and just say, just know He loves you. He's a God who gave Jesus to die for your sins, but now He's your Father. And talk to Him. Say, Father, have a conscience that you're in the presence of the one who loves you infinitely. He finds no fault with you. And He delights that you are coming to Him. He delights that you're trusting him with your prayer requests. See that and see if your prayers are not answered. Because when you come in a lie, you come to him like he's God. You sense distance. It's a lie. Everything is a lie. God cannot own that lie. God cannot answer and own that lie. For God to give you an answer is to own that lie. And that's the reason why you don't see results. Sometimes it's not the words you say, it's just coming to His presence and say, Father, and know this, He loves you. The new covenant is not about your love for God, it's about His love for you. And you you need to know that He wants to hear my voice. He wants to see my face. Father, you know, many times when I pray to the Father, I usually start off by saying, Father, thank you for loving me. Have you ever thanked Him for loving you? Thank you for loving me. It gives me a sense that He loves me. Long before I bring my prayer request, I must have that sense. I must have the sense that he longs to to have me in his presence, to hear my voice, to see my face first, then to hear my voice. I must have that. Now I'm telling you, this is the confidence we have in him. If we know he hears us, we know that we have the request we desire of him. Hmm? It's amazing how we, you know, this testimony here, I just want to share real quick. Are y'all blessed? Yes. This is from Honolulu. Da, 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 da. In 1993, this brother from Honolulu, he said that, it's a short one. In 1993, I was in a car accident that injured my spine, messing up my fourth to fifth lumbar vertebrae. As I could not walk, I had to undergo back surgery in 1995. The operation only made my condition worse, and I was in pain every single day. Some days worse than others, even my right knee and right shoulder were affected. For 15 years, my daily prayer was for healing and release from this excruciating pain. Then in 2008, I listened to a teaching by Pastor Prince titled, Rest in Jesus' Faith for Miracles. Even the faith for miracles. You don't, you don't come and say, I need the faith. I need the faith. You know, it's like so much strife. You gotta be, your complete means what? Is faith lacking? No, it's not. Just rest in Him. If I need faith, He will supply. You know what's the analogy of the vine and the branches? Whatever is in the vine flows in the branches. The only way to stop that sap is for the vine to try to tighten up. I must try my best. <laughs> Nothing flows, you know? Okay, he says that for 15 years, my daily prayer was for healing and release from this excruciating pain. Then in 2008, I listened to a teaching called Rest in Jesus' Faith for Miracles by Pastor Prince. I shared it with my husband. We were both excited and blessed by what we had learned, and it revolutionized my thinking about faith. I began to repeat. That's all she did. I began to repeat what Pastor Prince taught about Jesus' faith, but I wasn't praying about anything in particular. That night, 15 years, excruciating pain. That night, as I prepared for bed, my back made this snap, crackle, and pop sound twice. When I bent slightly over the sink, crawling into bed, I noticed that my back didn't really hurt. When I awoke, the agony in my back was gone. What a miracle. (laughs) Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. No hula baloo, jumping up and down, you know, like commanding all the time. Just resting. Just repeating what I said to a husband. When I, as the day progressed at work, both my knee and shoulder became free of pain as well. I was even able to walk up and down two flights of stairs. I am so thankful for the teachings on grace by Pastor Prince. What a blessing. Now, the, praise God, thank you, Jesus. 
You know, church, you got to be careful with this man's teachings. Even your friends, your colleagues, I can tell you this. This is not natural teaching. Grace is not natural. What is natural is this. Do your best to please God. And one of these days, if God sees that you are sincere enough, you're earnest enough, you know, maybe you'll be more complete than John over there, than Lucy over there. You'll be better off. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, I might exaggerate a little bit here, but that's what people think. It is, it is, it boggles your mind to say you are complete to start off. Now with that sense of completeness, walk out. I'm going to show you something back to back, okay? I, I, I don't know why my ministry is such that God always gives me ministries back to back, chapters back to back. And I'm a contextual preacher, which means I preach things in context in the way it appears in the Bible. In John chapter 19, is a story of the cross. Right? Why did Jesus cry at the cross towards the end? It is finished. All right? It is finished. John 19 verse 30, he cried, it is finished. Am I right? That's where it all starts. Where he cried, finish, we start. We start our Christian life with the finished work. When Jesus says it is finished, what is finished? The cup that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, full of our sin, full of our curse, full of our judgment. He drained, he drank it, he drained it dry. To his very last dregs. Finished, the judgment is gone. There's no more judgment for you and me. What about God's law? Satisfied. What about God's holiness? Magnified. Because God's holiness says, if you sin, you die. Somebody died. God did not say, okay, never mind. I'll compromise my holiness. No, Jesus died in our place. God's holiness is magnified. God's love expressed for men, for sinful men. It's finished. His first words recorded in the Bible when he was 12 years old was this. Didn't you know, he told his father and mother, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? His first recorded words. His last word was, finish in the Gospel of John. His earthly life. What was finished? The father's business. To have our sins forgiven righteously on a judicial foundation. Hmm? Then, this is John 19, right? Then he rose from the dead. On the third day, the disciples were afraid. They were in the upper room. They were hiding behind closed doors. Jesus appeared. And by the way, he's not a ghost. He, he, he told one of them to touch him. Flesh and bones. That's the kind of body you and I will have. And it's flesh and bones, yet it can transcend time and matter. You can't understand everything now because we are so confined in this world, but in the world to come, in the body you're going to have, it's a body that's physical. We, you and I can shake hands, yet we'll transcend time and matter. And that's why when the rapture happens, he transforms us first before he raptures us because in our new body, two things. You can transcend matter even though you're in a cinema, even though you're at a star. Your, your body can transcend. Number, number three, many of us can't take the height in our old body. We are afraid of heights. So it changes in a new body where there's no fear. I think so, like the last part. Okay. <laughs> so, when he rose from the dead after it is finished, he meets them and he shows them his wounds, which is the righteous foundation for, for him to say this, peace be unto you. So, peace be with you comes next. John 20, that's John 19, it is finished. John 20, in the next chapter, peace be with you. Huh? Peace is founded on the finished work. And then the next chapter, we are going to John 21 now. One week after he rose from the dead, he was walking by the lake of Galilee. The fishermen, uh, his disciples were fishing in the lake of Galilee. You all know the story. He made breakfast for them. After he finished breakfast with them, he asked this question. Do you love me? Do you love me? Next chapter, John 21. Look at the sequence. Do you love me? Comes after it is finished. Peace comes based on the finished work. Then he asks, do you love me? 
I'm going in order, people, the order of the Holy Spirit. And at the end of that chapter 21, he looked at Peter and said, you follow me. You follow me. You got it? Now, the true Christian life starts with, is predicated on, it is finished. You're complete in Christ. It's finished. Your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. Amen. Now you should possess the peace. He says, peace be with you. Receive it. Therefore, being made righteous with God, we have peace. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Okay? Possess it. Then after that, he asks you a next question. After you are resting in the finished work, after you are enjoying the peace with God, you know that there's no, no more war between you and there's nothing, you know, between you and God anymore. God is your father. You're so close to him. He asks, after all that I've done for you, is there anything in me that you see that will cause you to love me? It's a question. We say yes. Then he asks, do you love me? And then when you say, yes, Lord, I love you, then he says, follow me. Get it? I'll tell you what traditional Christianity teaches. Start from here. <laughs> Begin by following Christ. You people, <laughs> you are too lazy to follow Christ. All right? Lazy to wake up early in the morning, lazy to do this, lazy to do that. You must begin to follow Christ. Only those who follow Christ will be raptured, depending on your doctrine, your background. Only those who follow Christ will make it. Don't think easy Christianity, sloppy, agape, greasy grace can get you into heaven, okay? It sounds so amazing. It sounds like, wow, man, this guy is preaching the fire. Yeah, what fire is it? It's strange fire. It's starting from the wrong foundation. Begin. They teach you, begin to follow Christ. All right? And do your best to love him. Do your best to love him. And then you will have peace <laughs> when the work is finished. <laughs> Don't laugh. How many of us still believe this? And I've shown you the, the sequence of the appearance of these words. It is not natural. This excerpt is brought to you by josephprince.com. To get the full message, visit josephprince.com.